All right, welcome everybody to this uh, yeah, webinar, one set dev webinar, reinforcement learning and finance from playing games to algorithmic trading. It's actually already the fifth in a series of uh, these webinars about reinforcement learning and finance. And today's major topic is related to what we have been doing in the previous webinar, where simulation was kind of like in the focus. Simulation, Monte Carlo simulation, is one of the approaches to overcome the problem of having usually only limited data. Uh, you can also say too little data available for reinforcement learning purposes. And what we are today going to introduce is another approach, namely that we add some noise to the historical time series data so that we stick, if you like, to the basis, um, to the basic time series that we have available and then add noise to it. So um, the idea, <laughs> roughly speaking, would be that the reinforcement learning agent, the training board, learns to differentiate between signal and noise. So we really are adding noise to it and then the signal in this context, the simplified manner would be uh, the original time series, right? Uh, so the agent shouldn't, uh, yeah, shouldn't overfit in a sense that uh, what is given as data is uh, quote unquote the only thing that is correct in the world, but rather the agent should learn the underlying patterns. And this is what um, we are usually after, right? To learn about the fundamentals. But uh, we will see this as usual based on yeah, the concrete implementation. And it will be in line with what we have been doing before. So not that much new, particularly also not with regard to the uh, agents, the simple DQL agent and the FQL agent that we have introduced. Uh, and you know the background here is uh, primarily, not yet anymore fully, but primarily here the book Artificial Intelligence and Finance, right now for algorithmic trading might give you a framework to put this all into action. But the resources here are, if you like, self-contained. So there's the GitHub repository, um, which has been updated just before the webinar. So there are three new notebooks with the noise uh, element added to it. You can execute it also on Colab. It takes quite a while, so compared to my M1 uh, Mac machine, it's pretty, pretty slow, but still it works, right? You didn't need anything else than this link in the browser, right? Uh, of course, you, you can and should join the Discord server if you haven't done so, and you can also, if you like, follow on Twitter. But um, yeah, let's dive into the, um, um, the notebooks, even if you haven't uh, followed the previous um, sessions, this shouldn't be that much of a problem. A, you have access to all the resources that you see here. B, there are recordings available on our YouTube channel for the other um, webinars. You can always get back and maybe have a look at it um, uh, twice or for a third time. If you say, well, this was an interesting aspect. If you haven't seen them, you can also, after this webinar, go back and, and watch the recordings and then maybe go through the resources. Uh, but the structure has been uh, more or less the same with a rough structure of uh, finance environment, which is in line with the open air gym environment for reinforcement learning. Um, and we have uh, yeah, DQL, deep Q learning agents. And the more elaborate one is called financial Q learning agent. So um, you have. In any, in any case, you have all the resources that you need to reproduce and replicate what I'm doing. So speaking of what I'm doing, um, I have a bit bunch of notebooks. Maybe I close here, maybe some of them. And just for those who haven't maybe used it, so I only recently got a bigger fan of Colab, but I think they have done a great job. So here you see the link that I've shared. I call it research.google.com and then simply get up why you'll pitch RL Finance and this overview opens, right? And then you see already all the notebooks. And when you go to the Jim Cartel notebook, the first one, usually when this is uh, something that is from whatever resource, um, it asks you here or warns you that this notebook was not authored by Google. And I think this is for the majority of these notebooks. So you almost always, uh, I guess, need to click uh, run anyway. Um, so far, I think almost everything that is required for the code that I'm sharing here in the webinar series is available on um, Colab. So no need to install, for example, here the gym environment. So this is typically. I would say not standard for data science, but if you're in reinforcement learning, you probably, probably have installed it. Or here, when I 
click through this and can instantiate it. And the reason why I'm getting back to the uh, gym environment is that I want to briefly recall what's going on there. So in particular with regards to a state where we have done a reset here, right? Um, and reset, resets the environment. And as we recall, when I repeat the exercise without having fixed um, seed values, etc., I will get different starting values. They will be somehow related. So it's not like that we get uh, minus 10 plus 10. Um, here you see the values are basically all close to zero. But nevertheless, when I repeat the execution of these two cells, things change. So we have this random element here in this environment. So random starting points. And this is basically what I want to mimic today with uh, yeah, another version of the finance environment. Um, so that we have something similar. What we won't uh, be able to introduce is the element that in the gym carpool environment or this and any other gaming environment, the agent has a direct influence of what is happening, right? Um, so here we will still work with a form of static data, but nevertheless, at least the one element, which was missing before, uh, the element of randomness, um, where the base system is the same, uh, this is added with what we are going to do. Therefore, I wanted to quickly get back to here the gym environment and to show that the initial state, if we don't fix uh, seed values for the for the uh, gym environment, changes. So, and this is something. This is a characteristic that we are going to re-implement to mimic with um, our new environment as of today. And you see, the execution here is pretty straightforward. You click on the notebook and it opens and you confirm that you want to execute it and then you are good to go here um, to execute it. Maybe if there's something missing in terms of a package, it's easy to do pip install or con install, I guess should work as well, but pip install is what I will resort to here. Um, I'm not sure whether they, they use conda at all, but with pip. For example, let's say Jim would be missing you would simply do pip install gym and then you should be good to go with an exclamation mark maybe when you execute it here from the um, notebook. So the first notebook here, which has a subtitle up there saying something about noise. <laughs> so um, adding noise to the time series data. And again, the major purpose here is to overcome the problem of um, to overcome the problem of having just limited data sets. Limited, really, when we, everything that we have used is end of day data. And even if we go back 40 years, 50 years, I think 40 years usually is kind of the maximum that you can get. Let's say Apple went public 40, 42 years ago, right? You get 40 years worth of end of day data. That's pretty limited, right? It's just like a couple of uh, thousand data points. And for many, many applications, that's simply not enough. So noise might be one way of it. I'm not saying that's the best one or the only one or the one that you should prefer, but it's at least one option that we have. The imports here are the typical ones and uh, for TensorFlow carers as well. So I try to avoid the output as much as possible um, for carers because or TensorFlow rather, uh, it's pretty verbose. So I'm setting the lock level just to errors, right? And the agent, this is what I was saying, so when you have followed along the other uh, webinar, but the agent here is basically the same. So um, from the very first DQL agent that we had here in the base Jupyter notebook, um, there are basically no changes. Maybe here and there a parameter has changed, right? So maybe I change epsilon decay or um, I change epsilon minimum or whatnot, but the whole structure here with regard to the, the core, which means the deep uh, neural network, is not really deep, we have just two in layers, etc. The act method, replay uh, learning that's basically all the same. So we can still apply with what we're going to do the same agent and can train it on now a different way of presenting the data to the agent, namely by adding some random element. In that sense, agent the same, we just focus here on the environment. You might recall here. These two classes are just to mimic really the, the API um, and the approach of OpenAI in this context, right? So you see already here my major import for the randomness for the noise uh, from NumPy. I import the default uh, random number generator. It's kind of like the new way or the more recent way of doing all this. 
And let's have a look how the, this class has changed. For those who followed along closely, um, yeah, you might see the differences immediately. We have now noise as a parameter, standard deviation as a parameter, and seed. We had seeds before, right? Here in a slightly different uh, context, namely to set the seed for NumPy. If this is um, desired, so I won't use it, I think, throughout, but uh, there might be use cases where this might be good. But noise is now our flag to say, uh, yeah, we want to have noise, white noise, particular here, um, so normally distributed values, which should distort our base time series based on a standard deviation. You will see how I use the standard deviation. It's not like, uh, because we allow here for different time series, so this is just in relative terms and the calculation will be done down there. So that's already it in that part. Um, and the first major difference here happens uh, in the prepared data part, right, where we now have the calculation that I mentioned before, so the scaling. So we take the the original time series, take some mean value, let's say for the euro yes dollar, this might be something, I don't know, between 1.2 and 1.4 or something, um, times the standard deviation value that I have assumed, so 0 0.005 by default, uh, more or less arbitrary, I just wanted to uh, avoid something too large or too, too small, right? We will see the impact on the numbers uh, in a minute. Then we add to the data set itself. Now, the standard, not the standard, normally, the normally distributed random numbers. The mean shall be zero, standard deviation just as calculated here based on the scaling. And we take it from there. Right? We have the base time series, we add the noise around it, and then we go from there. We behave, or the finance environment behaves as before. And we have also one difference. This is now um, yeah, a, a question of how we want to handle this. So I would say it would make sense to have for every reset a new um, <laughs> noised noisy time series right? we could say well it's good enough for us that we have like one new time series but like with Monte Carlo simulation um, here i do the self-prepared data for every reset so that we still stick to the base time series but we again add noise which is random so that we have now another um, um, noisy time series based on the original one. So usually I stick here to your yes dollar that we have used uh, before as well. And then the rest more or less is the same. So we don't need to worry that much how the rest works. It's just now different data that the finance environment spits out. We have this random element and for every reset that we um, do, the um, data is generated anew and then it goes through the whole algorithm and spits out data as the agent moves step by step through the environment so it goes day by day one step forward does a prediction then internally is checked whether the accuracy is uh, still high enough or not if it's too low then there's an early break and if it's uh, good enough what the agent is doing and predicting then the agent can play can predict until the very end of the data set. So that's the basic idea. The only difference, to highlight it again, is that we now have noisy data here. So the instantiation of the environment, uh, here I make it explicit now, um, noise true, standard deviation like 1%, if you like, in that sense that I take the mean of the price over the whole time times this value, so here I take like 1% um, um, as my um, value for the standard deviation, so for the volatility, for the second moment of the normal distribution. Then I do a reset first, right? So let's check, and when I do another reset, I see that numbers have changed, not that much. This is what I was saying. This, of course, depends here on my assumption. When I say 1% is not that much, maybe if I go with like 10%, example, then the changes might be larger. So depending on what you want to emphasize here, or you want to say, well, uh, just a little bit of noise should be enough, or I want to have a really noisy, 
that's now pretty easy to scale. But whenever you do a reset, here you get a different initial state. And this is what I wanted to illustrate and uh, to show that this is now somewhat in line with the OpenAI gym environment. Again, we are missing, we're lacking the point that the agent here has direct influence of what is happening. Um, this is not yet the case for our environment, but still this one element now is better um, uh, replicated here with this yeah, addition of noise to the original time series. And I can repeat this over and over and when I don't fix any when I don't fix any seed, right, I always get another initial state. And so I don't know. I haven't played around too much with it. So it would be 5%. Maybe we go with 1% and, and check it also for 10% and see what, what's happening. So the way it is set up, the next notebook makes a difference. The way this is set up here is that the whole time series, and in that sense, um, given the coding, both features and labels are influenced by the noise. So I have another variant later, but uh, currently we should uh, take into account that everything is now noisy. So the derivation of the features, the derivation of the labels, all is now um, impacted by the noise that we add. Right, but once we step here through um, the time series, right? The, once I have added the noise and I've done my calculations, the time series is then of course fixed. No impact, no feedback whatsoever. And just like a little, uh, a brief look, let's say, uh, into the statistics. So when I go here with noise falls, this would be the base case that we had before. Uh, this would be our starting, um, environment right i can redo this i will always get the same starting point i can repeat this 10 times when i don't have any noise in this case now i will always work with the base time series right? uh, numbers are normalized here so this is what we need to take into account but nevertheless they are the same the same numbers and the mean value here is uh, negative so over time the uh, price um, has decreased although even no, uh, yeah, that's fine. I was just checking down here. I have the underscore, which is normalized data. Here's the uh, the real data, not normalized. So we indeed have, um, on average, annualized here a negative return evolution, if you like, um, and the standard deviation like 8.9 percent. With the normalized data, no surprise, right? This is exactly what we would expect. Here, no matter what we do before, uh, the algorithm makes sure, the normalization algorithm makes sure that we have a mean value of zero or basically zero, um, as we can see here, as well as a standard deviation of one. That's not that much of a difference, right? <clears throat> there is somebody asking about the volume. I don't know if uh, the volume uh, stays too low. I see it here like, um, going pretty high actually um, on what is displayed. If there are still issues with um, the volume or audio, please let me know. So in the other case, now adding noise true as a parameter instead of false. Um, when I now go through this and I repeat the exercise here, you see we get different data, right? different, 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 every time I reset the environment. But overall, no matter what is happening now, um, the numbers uh, remain roughly uh, the same. Of course, not exactly. We will see, we will have numerical differences um, there, but it's basically on the same level right here. We have, this is the original data, minus 0 0.025 annualized, and here it's minus 0 0.024. So a lot, law of large numbers, yeah, we would have maybe something um, <laughs> that's exact here, uh, but for the volatility, uh, standard deviation, we, we would expect a little bit of an addition because we add something, some noise. Um, if it's by chance negatively correlated, you see here 
uh, it diminishes. But the orders of magnitude, the numbers, the statistics that we see here, they are basically the same. <laughs> and no surprise, I said, no matter what we do before, uh, with regard to adding something or subtracting or whatever, adding noise or even something deterministic, or whenever we have done the normalization, uh, we get back to our zero and one for the first and second moment. So I just wanted to um, show that there is not like a huge impact in terms of the, the mean values and the standard deviation, but there is a slight impact. The impact is not that, that large, right? So wonderful. Everything else seems to be hearing good. I'm not hearing good, but <laughs> the, the transmission seems to be loud enough. So now the learning, the agent is as it was before, uh, 500 episodes, and let's get started with the learning. And we need to recall that now every time, so when we see episode 101, 102, 103, the agent is faced with a different data set, not a completely different data set, but yeah, with different noise, so to say, the, the base, stays the same and we have now a little noise, a little bit of noise. And as I said before, maybe we can check later on what, what happens when we, instead of like 1% at 10% of the um, of the average price as noise. So let's see, first, first try here with a little noise and see what's happening. So shouldn't be that much longer. And we have a pretty slow epsilon decay, so a high value for epsilon decay, 9975 or what it was. So it's basically for a pretty long time preferring exploration versus exploitation. So after 500, still at the almost 30% for the testing. And oh, this doesn't look too good. But why do I print this out here? This is just also to show that for the testing, right, we start now at a different initial state, a different configuration. So also for the testing, of course, uh, where we just rely on the optimal policy, we of course still have like different time series data. And you see in some instances here, uh, the differences, uh, if not huge, but are kind of significant. Okay? So here in this context, it hasn't been too good, but maybe we simply give it another round. So here after a warm start, the longer it runs, The later we get here with regard to the number of episodes, the longer it takes for every single episode. And what I was saying and mentioning here, right? I'm working with just one, and of course, I can go with much more noise here. And we can debate what is kind of like a good value here. If it's too high, actually, we could argue that this doesn't have to do anything anymore, really with the original time series but still we will see the structure uh, nevertheless there so uh, but it's easy enough for us to change and have a, a look at it right so here the 500 uh, this might take a while so we probably or do not have to wait it out you see it's still increasing on average but while this is running, I might open the other notebook here. So this is not needed, but the other three, the 10 one. And this is pretty close. It has the same basic agent, the same basic agent, but there is one major difference. And this is in the comments. So the agent is the same. The beginning of the notebook is the same. Uh, here, the start of the environment is the same. There's just the difference here with regard to the data preparation. And what is that? So while the other agent is still learning um, and trying to improve, what I've come up here with is a slight variation in the sense that I say, um, I take the market direction as a given, but I want to have noise for the features data, right? 
So that's uh, that's uh, uh, we can debate that. So I haven't seen this. I don't know if people would consider the one thing good practice or the other. Uh, but I thought actually the market is the market, and uh, if we train something, uh, we want to train it in a way that even if there is some noise attached to the features, right? that um, it nevertheless is able to predict the, the labels. And by the labels, I mean the real ones and not ones that we have like by chance uh, yeah, uh, distorted based on some noise algorithm, right? So um, I don't know, I would love to hear your feedback if you have an opinion on that, um, but it's not that difficult to implement. So I needed to change basically just here in this method a couple of things right so maybe we can even um, delete this and what is happening here is that before i add any kind of noise here i go with the original data i calculate the log returns and then i derive the directional data which is our label state right so d is calculated first then i go at the uh, noise I recalculate now the returns data, which I usually use here as the features data, and move on from there. But I stick to the unnoisy um, directional data and can see what happens there. It's just a variant. Of course, this could be implemented uh, in the same class as well with another flag saying labels, uh, noisy labels, true or false. This could be done easily but i thought here for the for the sake of the argument and for clarity i differentiate it and given how i do it here i need to add a few specifications here like uh, self symbols self symbol and in a couple of places i need to be a bit more specific as the code before but apart from that the rest now works in the same way in my um um, features here, there's slight differences, it's well too small, maybe I should go with five, let's say, All right, five here, and the rest is then the same. So now that we have seen this, let me check here, and wonderfully enough, the weight has uh, paid off, now epsilon has decreased to 0 0.08, only in 8% of the cases for the exploration, but this took like three additional minutes, you see like three times as long as the first 500. And this time around, now we got it perfect. So the agent for the three tests got it perfect. I could also go now, uh, the three is from before where I said, well, if we have a fixed time series, we can test it three times on a fixed time series or 300 times. It will always be the same result, right? Because there's nothing um, stochastic or nothing that changes really. So I could go here and could do 10, let's say, with 10 different initial configurations of the time series and then moving through it and see if it does for like 10. So in that case, fortunately, it has learned to differentiate the noise from the signal. And by signal, I mean here the real price, right? So some fundamental patterns independent of the noisy stuff that we see here. and um, yeah, the performance is uh, accordingly also increasing over time. So the moving average here and um, the value itself towards the end, uh, pretty high, close to 2000 and uh, without exploration, 2500. Yeah, we see one approach to overcome the problem of uh, <laughs> little data that we have for later. Let's see how it works here in this context. And maybe I go with uh, a thousand from the outset. Maybe also 10 here. So this is not too slow, but still it takes a little bit of time. Reinforcement learning, the algorithm as it is implemented here, I think I highlighted this a few times, is simply a sequential algorithm. All the learning is happening based on batches and the single um, memories of every batch from our DECU object, right? The memory object uh, is done 
one after the other, step by step, sequentially. Therefore, uh, this takes a bit <laughs> because the data that we use here and the number of uh, yeah, samples that are used to train and retrain and do the replay is actually pretty small. But since we start over and over again, right, it takes quite a bit. We don't have that much of a parallelization uh, benefit here, given the implementation. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, somebody asking uh, for those who might not be <laughs> active uh, in the financial industry, what is the difference between uh, signal and noise? Yeah, I don't know if there is a, an absolute clear cut definition, but when you have a look at market data, financial market data, um, uh, people say that this is pretty noisy data, which means you have many changes in let's say the price of an instrument which is simply a change given stuff that is going on in the markets but this change might not necessarily have something to do with some fundamental developments evolutions changes that might be going on right so you have for example to make it a bit more specific when you have a look at apple and uh, in theory, when you when you get started, maybe studying finance, what you learn is yeah, Apple is a company, and the company has revenue, a company has costs, and you can calculate cash flows and discounted cash flows, um, extrapolated in the future when you discount them back, they give a fair value. And the fair value should be roughly what you see as price in the markets, right? So if something changes, so Apple comes out with a new killer product. Uh, let's say uh, getting back in time with the iPhone, then you would project higher revenues at a relatively low cost basis, so Apple would be worth more. Uh, this would be a fundamental change and, and the signal. But of course, when you have a look at uh, Apple price data, and you can, of course, even today, easily look at the tick data, at the millisecond by millisecond data, you will see changes in the price, which have nothing to do with anything fundamental. Right. So. And by fundamental, I mean directly related to what is going on in the company and what is going on in the market. Of course, uh, there are things going on in the financial market, but the question is really, what is the signal? What, what should be relevant for somebody making a decision? And what is simply noise, right? So things change, prices change, but not everything that you see as a change might be something fundamentally relevant. So that would be my take on trying um, to do that. Of course, when you have a look at the history the prices, right? And you want to learn from that, you can ask the same question. You can say, well, things have changed last year or two years, right? And what of that what we see there is really something relevant. And what was simply something driven by sentiment or some other developments that have nothing to do with the company and the future, um, etc. So Again, I don't know what, what the clear-cut definition would be here, but the signal is that what is relevant for any kind of decision, trade, etc. And the noise is supposed to be something that is irrelevant, that is simply there, um, but has no fundamental cause, no macroeconomic cause, no microeconomic cause. It might be only driven by some specific constellation in the market. So it was a pretty lengthy thing, but I didn't feel too hurried because it's still uh, training here and it's also improving. So the features um, here in this simple approach is only, so here we have it, I'm just working with returns, just like four legs of the returns, normalized returns. So speaking of the features, we have four features, normalized log returns. So in the next Jupyter Notebook, for those who have followed along, you know that we get a little bit more elaborate where we can have multiple features and, uh, and then we can discuss yeah, how many lags, what features we use. Here it's a standard setup is just one feature, either the price or the lock return and four lags. That's uh, currently it. Yeah, somebody uh, volunteer, thank you, uh, another. A quant perspective on signal noise. Signal gives you a stance, overboard, oversold, neutral noise. Uh, for example, just volatility is a force pushing the price away 
from uh, the fair value. Yeah, the question is really what is, um, how do you come up with fair value? This was the beginning of my story, right? In theory, you would say that you have like a company valuation approach for Apple to stick to the example. You do all the calculation in a huge spreadsheet and then you get the number, given a number of shares traded and then you compare this to what is going on in the markets. And so the argument here would be that everything that is above or below uh, the fair value is something that is um, that is or can be considered noise. Right? Um, I would say noise is the stuff that you should, in the best case, completely ignore and signal is what you would like to filter out um, in order to uh, base your decisions, your investment and trading decisions on. So uh, getting back to the results here, right? Um, the learning here we get through, right? It's uh, four minutes. Um, the epsilon, the test now, here in this case, it wasn't that good. So, uh, with regard to the fixed labels, um, it didn't work uh, too well. So, honestly, I don't know why this is happening here in this particular case when we fix the labels, right? You recall this was the major difference before. Everything noisy, and now we have it, but maybe there are forces at work which uh, prohibit for the same set of labels with different features to have um, um, to have a proper relationship model there, right? So, uh, therefore, I you might have noticed that when I introduced this variant that I wasn't really sure whether it makes complete sense, but this came to my mind that when things come to my mind, I can sit there maybe for eight hours and try to think it through. But if it's easy and yeah, straightforward to implement, I usually go for the simple implementation and have a look first and then start thinking. So this might be the point because I just did this particular thing here today. Therefore, I don't want to spend too much time. Maybe you have your opinion or can play around and uh, report back with your results. So now um, the more advanced classes. Two classes as before, um, the Q learning agent now called FQL so for financial Q learning agent, because there was the question, what are the features that you use there? And uh, I said, it's just one, four lags. Now with the, um, both the new Q learning agent as well as the new finance environment, we will be able to add more features to the mix in the same fashion. And here I go with the yeah, fully noisy time series. So I'm not trying to fix labels, data or whatnot in this uh, context. So the improved finance environment here, I start with the finance environment. It's now as follows. So simple features, you see here, I can specify features as before, but before it was more like a placeholder, right? I just, could choose one window is now for those financial features that are statistics like rolling statistics, simple moving average, or momentum, or rolling volatility. A number of lags can be chosen before it was simply fixed to four. This was the setup. Leverage, not relevant, but can be included. And the minimum performance here is like the accuracy before. So whenever the agent um, gets below a performance of 85% uh, cross, so loses 15% or more, then we consider uh, the trading game here to be lost by the agent. The uh, data preparation works now the same as with the first the 09 Jupyter Notebook that I introduced. So when we set the noise flag to true, then we scale here the, um, um, the standard deviation that we want to use based on the price. So again, euro, yes, dollar between, I don't know, 1.1 and 1.45 or whatnot over the 10 periods that we consider. Uh, if this would be now the S&P 500 or the VIX index, or if this would be the Apple stock price, of course, we will need another scaling here when we add this in absolute terms to the price state. Maybe we can have another example with some stock or whatnot. So I'm, I'm so used to the UES dollar and the Forex story. Um, maybe it's a, a bit overused already. Here I can specify a start uh, point. Um, lock returns. S here is for the standard deviation. M is for momentum. V is for volatility. And momentum volatility based on the lock returns. 
and I can do here, this is for the validation environment, I can do the normalization with statistics that I pass here to the class. Right. Yeah, but the rest, again, I can only say that if you're following along, uh, the class, apart from the changes that are highlighted here, um, it's uh, basically the same. Also here, like with the Monte Carlo simulation, for every reset, we will get, as before, another time series, another noisy time series in this uh, context. And down here, the reward now consists of getting the right prediction or being correct with regard to the prediction, as well as with regard to the return. So if I'm on the right side, I get a positive return, scaled up here. If I'm on the wrong side, so long short, right, um, I will get a negative, um, a penalty, if you like. So reward two can be, of course, negative uh, in that sense. It's not a reward, it's a penalty. For the environment now, the window set to 10, five lags, noise, yes, and standard deviation, maybe I go with 1% here as well. Tenth of a percent, maybe a little bit too low. And again, here, when I repeat this over and over, you see we get stuff that is somehow related, but it's not exactly the same. So I can repeat this a hundred times and I will always get different feature sets. Now, here, um, with regard to the question from before, what features do you use? Now, I'm using price, I'm using return, and I'm using volatility. Maybe I go with others here, so maybe not the price in this context. Might not be the best that we can do. Maybe we go with the return, uh, momentum, and volatility. But we can go with all or just with one. So you can add also your own statistics when you say, I'm a big fan of, I don't know, RSI, for example. If you can add RSI um, with Python code, then you can use it here as well. And for sure you can uh, add all the statistics. So now, once we have said that, the same um, procedures as before, we reset the environment, we step forward step by step. The agent, of course, now needs to be able to take into account um, the additional features. But this is what the whole thing was set up for in the first place. So as the agent before it didn't need to be adjusted here, this agent um, doesn't need to be um, adjusted in any case. So we simply have the focus here on different yeah, ways of generating data. Before it was Monte Carlo simulation based on our Einstein Wombeck mean reverting uh, process with a couple of parameters that we could choose, right? So we could mimic something that is trending, we could mimic something that is mean reverting, etc. Here we now have the base time series and then we do um, like feed the, the noisy time series to the agent. So the environment now, um, oh, here I go now with different features, yeah. R, S, M, V, maybe I, I leave out S, price data, usually doesn't work too well, and S is price related. And in this case, when you recall, we have a learning environment and a validation environment, uh, which is uh, used to check throughout um, what the performance on the validation data set is. So what is happening here? DeQ or I skipped over uh, this one little, here. So of course, in the Jupyter Notebook, we need to execute sequentially. And now it is learning. Time series is the, the base time series is the same. Your yes dollar, we add noise, 1% was the factor. Um, every time, so episode 17 has different data than episode 20, right? And here you see now after every 20th iteration episode, we see the validation. So the performance is not yet uh, fantastic, just 0.95%. Hopefully this is getting better. Performance on the training data set in between, I saw a two point something. So this is now, I would say, a little bit more relevant. And now you see the performance on the validation data set. 
has increased uh, yeah, for, from a loss of 4.6% uh, to a profit of 8.9%. So if this would be now the direction that we are heading towards, this would be great. But no guarantee for that as long as uh, we are uh, still at the early stages. So I need to be careful with being too early, too hopeful. Uh, this could be validated. What do I have today? Power of coffee. No, it's tea today for my wife. I think the tea is a little bit better than coffee. I made a fourth be with you. At least Star Wars, the dark side here, yeah, we can go with some tea in the Darth Vader cup. So it doesn't take that much longer. Let me see in the meantime if we have no I think these have been the questions so far. All right. And here the performance deteriorates for the validation data set. And 20 more, and then we should be good to go in this context. But I think that's overall, I would say this is kind of like an interesting um, this is kind of an interesting approach with the noise because indeed uh, with the discussion and my rather lengthy, uh, not really elaborate um, try to explain the difference between signal and noise. Um, um, explanation to really overcome the one the, the one major issue, right? If you have just one time series on which you train uh, your agent, uh, overfitting is kind of like almost inevitable, right? <laughs> because if you train it long enough, uh, and I think my my analogy was the last time that if you have um, like one game of chess and uh, you have an agent supposed to learn the game of chess and you just train the agent based on this one game of chess. We all have an idea that this wouldn't work at all, right? Um, so even if we have like a hundred games of chess, historical ones by crack masters or a thousand ones, and try to train an agent based on a thousand, one thousand historical games, well played, um, almost no mistakes, right? It's still not that much, right? With Alpha Zero and, and uh, the Deep Mind story, uh, playing agents uh, or to let the agents play against each other or different iterations at least, uh, then you can generate like a million different games and uh, the agent can learn from what the agent is doing, right? So we are not yet there again with regard to the impact factor, but uh, with regard to the number of iterations based on always different data. This is at least what we um, have there. So. The performance here, this is like the total reward, so the number of um, correct predictions. You see this is going up steeply, then deteriorates and goes further up. There again, we know this is a chart that we have seen already before. This is really variable here, the cross performance. So also given that we have still lots of exploration. Um, the, the green line here, the validation line, that's kind of like the important one. And towards the end, you see it, it, it a little bit stabilizes on, I don't know what this is, maybe the 0.89% that we see there. But I promised you to, and I forgot almost again, to do this with something else. So maybe you can, maybe you can uh, voice your wishes, but I go with, let's say, Apple. So that we have. Something else, yeah. Right. Yeah, there's another good question. How does it work, or what is my? I would I would formulate it a little bit more loosely and uh, simplify it, saying, what is my idea of of separating the signal from the noise. Um, by sticking to the base time series, we stick to real-world financial data. 
we add noise in the sense of like not really irritating the agent maybe we can formulate it like irritating the agent um, but overall if there are fundamental patterns in our historical data that the agent is supposed to learn so meaning filtering out the signals then they should be valid they should yeah, the agent should be able to filter it out even when we add a little bit of noise to it this is my idea right uh, again, when you have just one time series, deep neural networks are so good at fitting small data sets that in the end, with a fixed data set, you will get perfect results, right? And so here, with the noise, we simply avoid uh, getting to the um, getting to such um, uh, such a situation where <laughs> the deep neural network simply knows everything and considers everything to be a signal. Right, so we add noise and add noise as we go over and over again. And if there is something, some fundamental truths, if there are proper signals, they should still be learnable, uh, even if we add some noise to the story. So that's that's my my take on it and my thinking currently. Oh, there's somebody asking uh, when somebody is new to AI, which of my books? Um, should you start with? So if you want to get started with AI immediately, you can, uh, so I would say if you have a good grasp of Python already and know a bit of finance, right, then you can jump, uh, let's say, into artificial intelligence in finance. If you are getting started out both with finance and Python, maybe financial theory with Python would be a good starting point. Then Python for finance, at least the first two parts, would be a good starting point or the next point can also be a starting point if you want to skip the very basics, right? And, uh, but these are the books that I would recommend. Right? Um, so it depends on where you're coming from. If you are new to AI, but you know Python and you know finance, then jump into AI and finance immediately. If you want to refresh your Python skills and a little bit of finance, then we'll look at Python for finance. If you get started from the very beginning in the, in the areas, Financial theory with Python would, I think, be the appropriate starting point. This is what this book uh, was all about in the first place. So, having now a look here at Apple, um, well, with Apple, this doesn't seem to work uh, too well. So, when we check this here, it, oh, it works pretty well. What, what are the numbers here? It's only, um, I'm surprised that this is now almost perfect towards the end here. It is perfect, right? Um, for the training data set, but the validation data set um, is somehow the bad thing here. So the training um, goes pretty well here for it, but not for the um, validation data set, but we need to check uh, if there are some specific elements in the validation data set um, that make it so different to what we see in the first uh, part here. But maybe there's also one story that we have discussed implicitly, indirectly, mostly. Um, while Euro yes dollar is overall a mean reverting quantity, not always, but uh, on average a mean reverting quantity, right, with regime shifts up and down. Um, the Apple stock is a trending uh, quantity in this uh, context. Um, so let me maybe check with the, um, what do we have, the VIX index or with GLD, let's go with GLD, the gold um, ETF. And as a final example, see whether this might work here with another um, almost mean reverting quantity. It's, just, it's the same, right, for, for certain periods. Uh, gold uh, ETF prices also trend, uh, but overall as a commodity, it should be a mean reverting, right? There are also a good question, uh, a critical question in a positive sense. I really appreciate that. Uh, doesn't the existing noise on the time series uh, get interpreted as signal by the learner, even if you train it? with added noise. Yeah, um, of course, it's a good question. The, uh, when I rephrase it, I would say, yeah, you're right. The original time series has already noise, uh, but 
neither you nor I nor anybody else really, I think, can differentiate even historically uh, noise from signals in this context perfectly, right? Uh, and my idea was even if we have historical noise by adding more and more noise to it, the fundamentals should become clearer by adding more noise to it and learning with additional noise on the fundamental story. So we have just like with one historical time series, I could mimic this here and say, well, I have my historical time series and instead of um, adding new noise after every reset, I go just with one new time series and then train it or the agent for like a hundred times. I think this would be the trap in which we would uh, run into and tap into, right? So my hope is that when you add more noise or different noise to it, the agent has a more easy time to really get to the fundamentals and to the signal. So I, I don't have a formal mathematical proof in this context, um, but I can think of something maybe to, to illustrate and to make that point um, a, bit, a bit better, right? But good questions. I love them. I love them, right? <clears throat> Another um, suggestion here is with regard to getting noise from something else, some other sources. Yeah, how, I mean, if you if you do a, a sentiment analysis, uh, analyzing social network, etc., then all these approaches, for my feelings, are targeted towards avoiding or getting rid of the noise, right? Um, by adding noise here in a mathematical sense, I'm adding noise, right? So it's noisy data which I, if you like, use to somehow. Uh, indeed irritate the agent, right? To say, well, of course, uh, left, right, but don't be, don't be irritated. This would then be the next step. But in the left, right, have a look at the middle, at the real data, right? And uh, if you have like a hundred, uh, now we have like 120 exposures to different data sets, but with the same basis, uh, the hope would be that indeed um, the noise is somehow filtered out and what remains are proper patterns that can be somehow explored. At first, learned, and second, um, exploited. Another good question with regard to um, whether there is stability in the, in the optimal policies. Yeah, how it works here is indeed that we have the deep neural network, which represents our optimal policy in the few learning sense. Um, and the neural network in this context is trained and updated incrementally, right? This is the replay, this is like step-by-step step updating it. Um, in the beginning, larger changes with regard to the policy might happen. So uh, it might behave completely different after the first five episodes uh, compared to the next 10 ones, but the more experience, the, the more episodes we have done, the more replay, the more learning has taken place, uh, the fewer, the smaller the changes in the optimal policy uh, should become. So that's like a baby when it learns to walk, right? It's like huge differences. And it falls like 10 times a day, then five times, then one time, and then falls only every other day. Um, so, but it gets stay more stable over time. Right, and in that sense, the policy here becomes more and more stable over time. And we shouldn't forget that we we have basically throughout exploration as an element, as a relevant element. So as long as we have a larger uh, proportion here of uh, exploration, and this is still here at the 10% level, right? As you can see here, 10%, we still have uh, some erratic uh, behavior, uh, maybe, right? But as we can see now here. This is going up, 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 not too bad. And that one here for the VIX uh, is also on a relatively um, okay level, okay-ish level, whatever this means um, for the validation data. So it's not as worse as we have seen before, but for the VIX data, you see this is basically able to uh, improve 
almost yeah continuously right? it's like small drawbacks here but with the wix it learns it um pretty um pretty decently i would say so this is what we would like to have right we we don't like to have like these erratic behaviors so this is what we as human beings would like to have right we we get started with something and we have continuous improvements right and not like or i improve and then drawback when i follow i'm, I'm not a, I'm, a, I'm a big chess fan but not a big chess player for sure no I'm, I'm not even playing but when i follow along you know this is like for human beings it's not like that people playing chess over time and playing more and more that they improve that way but there are always like periods when when the performance deteriorates and when they lose more often and when they lose against allegedly uh, weaker players, etc. So this is kind of like almost perfect what we see here. Um, so with regard to the policy question, it should become more stable over time. The more exposure, the more uh, learning policy has had, uh, the more stable it should be. I mean, it also depends on the data. We are not presenting it, it here suddenly with completely different data so that there are large changes in the weights of the neural network data is basically similar and this is what i mean here so the more it has seen such data um, sets um, the more stable the policy becomes i think there's still lots uh, to do and, and to discuss and to think through but i hope uh, that jupyter notebooks as usual give you a good blueprint a good starting point for your own endeavors so let me know what you what you think or you can work with them maybe here i'm i go back maybe not to the to the vix the environments oh this was uh, this i was talking about the vix hey i wanted to do the vix but it was uh, gold and for gold um also as a as a somewhat mean everybody quantity um at least for certain periods of time certain time intervals uh, so the performance was not uh, too bad um, so play around with the different um different names, different symbols, different approaches, different parameterizations, maybe more noise, uh, less noise, and see how it all uh, behaves. You have it all, you can use Colab, you can clone the repository, and it should be easy enough to get started with, right? Okay, so I think that's it for today. Here are all the resources, let me know, and in that sense, happy reinforcement learning. For finance, I see you in one of the next webinars. Take care. Bye-bye.